Hillsong, the global megachurch that has more than 150,000 weekly attendees, 3 million Instagram followers, and had several A-list parishioners, is now shrouded in controversy. The church that made religion hip has faced allegations of financial and sexual abuse and fired their most high-profile pastor, Carl Lentz, after his extramarital affairs were exposed. This organization that billed itself as progressive and inclusive came under fire for its lack of acceptance of the LGBTQ community. Several reports claim that only those who fit the script were truly welcome, and their slogan of you belong came with an unwritten tagline, only if you do as we say. TV series, news articles, and podcasts have done deep dives on the allegations against Hillsong. This week, there is yet another documentary highlighting Hillsong's transgressions. Joining me on Navigating Narcissism is Noemi Uribe, who says they were duped and invalidated by Hillsong, bravely stood up to the powerful church, and faced a major reckoning about their faith. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. This episode discusses abuse, which may be triggering to some people. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. So, Noemi, it's such a pleasure to have you here. I had the uh, the real pleasure of watching you initially in one of the Hillsong documentaries. It's really nice to meet someone who in such a brutally honest way related your experiences in Hillsong. Thank you so much for having me. And I am ready to go on this journey with you. So yeah, I want to make sure that today we understand your whole story. So let's start at the beginning. What role did religion and faith play as you were growing up? It played the biggest role, the, I think the only role, um, the only thing I knew, I was born into Christianity, uh, more specifically a, a fundamentalist Pentecostal apostolic church. Um, so my grandpa converted to uh, this church. He was a spiritualist and my grandma was a medium and they left that life uh, for this new reality or this new experience of a uh, the Holy Spirit that they called. They wanted to understand this new spirit that they were encountering. Um, So they sold everything. They gave all their money to the church. um, And my grandpa was a minister and later on um, supported the church when they lost their pastor. He kind of became in charge for a little bit. But that caused all of his kids then to be raised in the church. Uh, So my dad, being the second to youngest, was born into it as well. And then when I came along, I was kind of like third generation going into this church. So it was a big part of who I was. Um, I would say the only identity I had was being a Christian. Um, They tend to do that when you grew up in church where you don't really know who you are. They kind of tell you who you are. Can you educate us a little bit, Noemi? What is a fundamentalist church? Uh, Fundamentalism is basically... um, a specific form, and it could be within Christianity, Judaism, Hinduism, Buddhism, really any religious background, but more specifically within Christianity. It's when they view uh, their Bible or their holy text as something more literal. They also tend to believe in end times theology. There was going to be an an end of times, um, and that the church was going to be either raptured uh, before all the bad things happened, or after all the bad things happened. Um, So you really grew up with this mentality that you needed to be prepared for the end times, which for me as a kid was pretty traumatic, Um, having separation anxiety from my parents, not knowing if they had been raptured or not. What was that like as a child to grow up with that kind of rigidity structure and inflexible belief system? 
Yeah, there was a bit of comfort in knowing where my place was in life, knowing what I could wear, what I could not wear, um, what I could, um, activities I could do, what I couldn't. Um, But it also really felt limiting, for sure. Uh, Once I started to grow up and and have more of a personality, realize that I was queer, um, that's where I started to push the boundaries and realize that the boundaries were not very big. Like it was a very small and enclosed um, space that I was navigating. Um, so really it was um, to give you examples of things I had to navigate. Um, I was not allowed to wear pants. Um, so I could only wear skirts that were below the knee. Um, my shirts, if they, I could not wear like a spaghetti strap or something thin. It had to be Um, cover my shoulders. I was not allowed to cut my hair. I wasn't allowed to wear open toe shoes. Um, If I walked into church, I had to wear a head covering. And so that was like a pretty big thing where you saw a lot more rules for women than men. Um, Usually for them, it was don't wear shorts to church. Don't wear anything too tight. Um, But that was pretty much it. They could do whatever they wanted. And often the responsibility was on the women to not have them fall. And what that means more within that church context was um, don't have them look at you and see you in a lustful way and kind of like think of you naked. And so it was really frustrating because it was like, okay, my knee is going to make them think about me naked. Okay, that's kind of disgusting. It's so interesting to hear what you had to say about as a child, there was a comfort in knowing what was expected of you like there was no ambiguity right children do well with that as much as they they might push back on a bedtime there are rules that actually it gives children a safe base but then children turn into pubescent kids and into adolescents and at that uh-huh. point they go through something called individuation the adolescent is trying to become their own person and that adolescence and fundamentalism seem like those two things are never going to go together because the adolescent by definition is trying to sort of become more autonomous, to separate away, to become their own person. And in essence, fundamentalism is saying no. And then on top of that, Noemi, you realized you were queer. Something you had to know was not going to be accepted in this space. When was that when you realized you were queer? And what was that process for you like psychologically? I knew by the time I was about four or five. Mm -hmm. Uh, because I had a crush on my preschool teacher. Um, She was cute. So I knew really early on something was different. As I started to grow, I was probably around six years old, seven, when my brother got married. Uh, He's the only brother I have. And I remember he brought my sister-in-law to our house um, so we can meet her. My mom was like, oh, you're the best daughter-in-law I have. And she laughed and was like, well, I'm the only daughter-in-law you'll ever have. And so they were laughing amongst them. And I was kind of just like thinking like, wait, why? Like, why can't I marry a girl? Like, why does it only have to be boys? And so that's when I started questioning like marriage or love within two people. Um, And I quickly learned as I got older Um, Because I never voiced these. It was never a vocal thing that I asked my parents, but I quickly started to realize um, within the system that it was Adam and Eve, not Adam and Steve, Um, or that it was um, that God had created these two people because he wanted them to be complementary and their reproductive systems fit together like a puzzle piece. So that's all the language they would use for us as kids. And for me, it was a quick reminder that oh, these two puzzle pieces don't fit together the ways that they're talking about. That means I can't do that, even though I have feelings for that particular puzzle piece. It was pretty uh, eye-opening as I got older um, to realize that. Um, They were very, very vocal with their homophobia Mm -hmm. and their view of LGBTQ people being, some people would use language like pedophilia. This experience for anyone, anyone still, sadly, in the world, is that for a child, for a young person to recognize that they're queer, it's not easy. It's not easy. However, in the context that you were in, Noemi, it 
at some level must have felt impossible. I mean, this must have been really psychologically challenging. Yeah, it really was because I came to realization that I couldn't be all of me, Mm. that I had to put on this mask in order to uh, feel the qualifiers of what people were looking for. I like to tell my mom that uh, the church I grew up in really taught me to be a great liar. And I felt terrible, the fact that I... I had to have this mask on the whole time uh, because I was being told that that was bad. Well, what what I'm hearing is that if you lived honestly and authentically to who you were, you were going to lose everybody. Yeah. And I ultimately did once I didn't care anymore, once I gave it up and said, I don't want to do this anymore because if I continue to do this, I will not last. And and a lot of young people don't last. And, And when I say last, it means like, Suicide ideation. This show is called Navigating Narcissism. And and that frame is just to understand how these sorts of themes and dynamics show up. And what was being asked of you as you were coming into your own, knowing who you were, recognizing you were queer, at a total level, almost everyone was being told, if you're not being exactly who we need you to be, then you're going to have to do something about that. Basically, who you are, who your true self is, doesn't work. And that right there is the core of all narcissistic parenting, actually, that the child is never seen for who they are and never cherished and cultivated to grow up to be their own person and to feel that they're loved unconditionally, that their true self is a valued self. And what we know is that when that happens to a person in childhood, the vast majority of times as that person comes into adulthood, they experience anxiety, a, a, a diminished sense of self, a lowered sense of self-worth. In more severe situations, as you had intimated, Noemi, there might even be suicidal ideation because basically you're told you're not good enough. And so be someone else. As your childhood un- unfolded, at what point did you begin questioning the teachings of your church? Um, I started questioning more when it came to science, but I I saw it happen more within college uh, when I started taking religion classes to learn um, the history behind Christianity and to learn what really is Islam and to learn Judaism um, not from a Christian perspective was really, really different to me and was really eye-opening. And that brought so many more questions. Um, And I started to realize that all religions had very similar perspectives and very similar values. And I came to the realization that it was no longer a space I could be in. Uh, So that was the big moment where I decided to to end it all and, and, and leave my parents' church. So what was that moment like when you decided to leave the church that your parents were deeply embedded in and that pretty much guided your childhood. It was hard. I remember I called my mom a few weeks before I did it. And I told her like, I I can't do this anymore. I can't be a part of this anymore. My dad had passed away and I went and had a meeting with the pastor. Before I walked in, I wrote a list of things and I sat down. I pulled in my sister with me for moral support. Uh, Even though I knew she probably couldn't speak in in my favor and my defense because she was a leader and she would be removed from her position if she supported me in any way. I open my notebook um, and I start reading and I get to point number two and he quickly stops me and he's like, I don't want to hear it. I've heard this before. This isn't anything new. He lifts up his Bible and starts like banging it in the, in the air. He's like, you're going to go to hell. And you're leaving the truth. And I don't know who twisted you, but your father would not be proud of you. So he starts using um, all these fear mongering tactics that I had been brought up in. He starts using my dad against me. I realized that there was no point in saying anything because I wasn't going to change his mind. So I ended up just letting him talk. And tears are rolling down my eyes because my body is realizing that there's something hard happening. Um, 
So I'm just wiping them away and just sitting in it. So I ended the conversation and I said, I am not here to ask you. I'm here to inform you. I do not want to be a part of this church as a member. Um, so please no, uh, remove me from any and all lists. How old were you when that happened? I was probably like 19 or 20. It's so interesting to hear you describe this because you had this recognition that this is my parents' faith, not my faith, for all the reasons you had. That kind of individuation, to be able to say, this is not mine, or these attitudes are not mine, is not easy for any adolescent to do. And that you did it in such a rigid structure is actually quite remarkable. So I, I have to say to you that that is actually what you did there in a large institutional structural setting is something that most people can't even do in their own families. Then there was that manipulation of bringing in your father, which actually is quite cruel, but even more impressive to me, you know, I mean, you went there and you stood your ground, was that you didn't engage. And many people might have felt compelled to clap back yell, scream, you know, get angry. And you were very steadfast in what you wanted. And again, it, you, like you said, your body knew something was happening and the tears were flowing. But it's a very inspiring story to me because I think that this was a system that wanted to subjugate you and invalidate you. And you didn't want to do that. I just want to take it all in. It was a lot. Um, it was it was hard. Uh, I don't share this one very often, but that following Sunday, I ended up going to church with my sisters. The news had obviously spread that I had formally left. Um, and so during the sermon, uh, which is a portion of a church service where the pastor or someone goes up to give a message about what God revealed to them during the week for the church. Um, it's usually lasts about an hour. He ends up saying a lot of very identifying things saying that people, young people were leaving the church and he's pointing at me the whole time, literally. Um, and, and looking over at me. So he starts throwing uh, rocks with his words and they're starting to hurt. And um, I'm starting to feel it. And my sisters are kind of holding my hands like, no, you got this. Like, don't listen. Um, and after the sermon was over, usually within these churches, they'll have everyone go up to the front of the church to pray. So I remember uh, the mom of my best friend came over to me and uh, she she stretched out her hand and was like, come and pray with me. And I was like, no, I'm okay. I'm going to pray here sitting, like, no need. I don't want to. Um, and she said, I didn't ask you. And so she grabs me, pulls me to the front. And all of these ministers came over, uh, the pastor's son, who was his assistant, and all of the, their wives started surrounding me. And putting their hands on me, that's usually how people pray. They lay hands, that's what they call it. And they start praying loudly. And I start hearing what they're saying. And they're saying that I have demons within me and that they want to release these demons, that something has a hold of me and that um, God has a greater plan for, you know, the typical lingo and manipulation that they used, um, so even within that moment, again, I started crying because it was getting difficult. And all I remember saying, um, I didn't know what to do, but all I could say was, um, God forgive them for they know not what they do. And they kind of all like looked at me and started to leave and they stayed quiet. And I grabbed a Kleenex and I cleaned my eyes and I sat down and I was like, I, I, I don't know how much more I could take this. That moment was very, very traumatic. Um, and a lot of what the pastor said was very traumatic um, because deep down, I did believe what he was saying, that I was going to hell mm -hmm. and that I was twisted. So that's where the transformation really started internally. Um, but that's where 
Hillsong also creeped in uh, within that healing process, uh, trying to find a church that was more quote unquote liberal and more welcoming and a place where I belong. For those who are listening to this and don't know what it is, what is Hillsong? Hillsong is a church that started in Australia about 30 years ago um, by a New Zealander um, named Frank Houston and later on Brian Houston. They ended up spreading the church into all around the world. It became a global church. So when a church is that big, they call it a mega church. Um, so they had about, it just in New York, about 10,000 people attending on a single Sunday. Um, so it came to the U.S. Um, through New York. And uh, New York started in 2010 and then spread to Boston, which is where I ended up attending. You said in, in 30 years. That's not that long ago. This is very recent. How did, why did it grow yeah. so big so quickly? Yeah, that's a good question. So I believe it was in the 80s. Um, that's when evangelicalism um, kind of married to fundamentalism and pe Pentecostalism was starting to grow in the U.S. as televangelism. Um, you see the, the Jerry Falwells of the world or the Robertsons, Pat Robertson. Um, there's many documentaries. Um, Tammy Faye. So all these people were starting to be very prominent. So Brian Houston comes to the U.S. and tries to understand what was happening here and how to best approach the church and how to spread this good news in a better way. So he sees the business of church in the U.S. and how they're doing it here. And he takes it back and transforms a local church that was steadily growing into this more fast-paced business. So... Okay, if a church is a mega church, are the people who are listening and showing up giving money? Because I'm trying to understand the business model here. Yeah, for sure. So within the system of Hillsong, um, and just in Christianity as a whole, the concept of tithing is mm -hmm. very, mm -hmm. very common, very used, um, I, I would say within 95% of churches. And tithing is when they give about 10% of their money, of whatever they earned to the church. So it can function um, to pay the pastor, because often it's the only job they have so that they can live, um, to pay any bills that the, that the building may have, things like that. When you have around a million people giving this 10%, that can add up to a lot. What also tends to happen is that within Hillsong, you have this... They, they quickly plant this idea that the church doesn't have a lot of money. And so then we need extra support. And so Hillsong had a group named Hillsong Partners. And you be can become a partner if you're giving at least $1 extra apart from what you're already giving. And this is often monthly. Um, so you get a lot of wealthy people giving extra money to be in this system of partners. And often within partners, there's different levels of what it means. So if you're giving $1, you're in the lowest level. If you're giving $100, maybe you go up a level. If you're giving 5,000, you're probably in the highest level of what it means. And you have access to more information on what the finances are happening. So that's kind of where the cultiness kind of starts. What does more money get you? They would say, um, that you could view more of where the money was being allocated, or they had more access to the pastors. Um, often within your local church, you can walk into the pastor's office after the service, ask questions about their sermon, um, or just in general about how things are going or needing support. Within Hillsong, um, there's often security around the pastors after their, the service is over, or even during. You can't really get to them. Uh, and so it's it can become difficult, but if you're a part of the partners, because you're giving more money, you can have access to them and you can talk to them one-on-one -on -one and they'll be present. So Carl Lentz will come in and he was like the main campus pastor for all of the East Coast or your local pastor within the church. Um, so people like the exclusivity of how it felt for them to be a part of Hillsong Partners. 
Um, and it was really interesting to see that dynamic. Uh, as someone who was a college student who really, or a grad student here in Boston who couldn't really afford much, it was it was hard to see um, all this money just being wasted on food that was being thrown away, um, mainly within the partners' meetings or like them using this money to rent out um, a wine cellar uh, because that's where they wanted to have their cool meeting um, so they can entice more people to give more money um, because they have this intimate meeting with Carl um, where he fake cries and everyone gets emotional. So it's very interesting um, to see that dynamic there. So I have a couple of things to say here. When people talk to me about spaces that are supposed to be infused with God and spirituality, my personal meaning around that is that all are equal in that space, that, that in any healthy conception of a religion or a God is that that's maybe the only time people could all be viewed as equal, right? This sounds like you'd be paying for access. It's like Coachella. Like if you spend more on your ticket, <laughs> yes. you can get closer to this, the people. I don't know that God was thinking that religion was supposed to be like a music festival, which is what this sounds like. It's this purchasing of exclusivity, which goes in the face of all that should be, I think, the core personally, of a healthy religion. But this also takes me to a question, Noemi, that I struggle with because I'm not in this world. These people are tithing. 10 percent is not a small amount, depending on what a person's making, especially at a time when the economy is so tight, whatever, okay? So millions of dollars are coming in. We have all heard those stories of these high-flying preachers having jets and Rolls Royces and $25,000 watches and mansions, you're talking here about exclusive dinners, you know, with in a, in a wine cellar and all of that. These are people's hard earned dollars that they're giving to a church that they believe in. I'm asking this to you as a person because you can't speak for everyone. You can only answer this for yourself as a person. How do you reconcile that as a member of a religious community? Personally, it was as as a child of someone who would take money um, to survive. Uh, my dad would would receive money from the church. Um, I saw it in a very different context when I was younger than from how I saw it at Hillsong. Um, we didn't have a lot of money. We weren't very like wealthy. Um, my dad had to have a second job. All of my uncles did as well. It's not a business you go to to become sure. rich. Makes sense. Um, within your local church. Yeah. The majority of the time. Within Hillsong, it was very different. And because I had this other experience, it was very frustrating. But the way that Carl... Carl Lentz was so good at doing um, was to talk about or, or more use the phrases of why should pastors have to live in poverty? Why can't I also have good things just because I'm a pastor, I have to live in poverty or I have to live in a certain way. And so then that kind of like switches the, t the tables on people and they're like, Oh shoot. Like I'm questioning my pastor. How do I do this? Um, so often as someone who was a volunteer and I was not allowed to give water bottles to the volunteers who were working under me because those water bottles were specifically for the pastors, that was as a public health professional and as an advocate and a human rights advocate, I did not like that. And so I would just give them out. I'm like, water is a human right. I would get in trouble all the time and I was like, I'll take the heat. I don't care. When I started kind of noticing that uh, the pastor wanted Altoids packaged in a certain way or wanted um, their water bottle to be opened before handed, handed to them uh, because he didn't want to use his hands to open it. Um, all of these like little things that were very childish and were very like, you're treating me like your servant kind of thing were very difficult to see. Um, and navigate. It is very frustrating though. And it's funny because you can flip the Bible to say many things the way you want it. And often when I think of this, 
of like people not being able to approach a pastor. I think of stories like the times when kids wanted to come say hi to Jesus and the disciples, which were kind of his security, (laughs) um, disciples meaning a student or a follower, um, stopped them. They were like, no, you can't access Jesus. And then Jesus got up and went over and was like, why are you stopping these kids from coming? Like, let the children come to me. And they went on their way. And he spoke to the disciples after and said, don't do that. Like, everyone is, can have access to me. You can't dictate who can or cannot, mm. especially children. Mm-hmm. And so when I see systems like Hillsong, who are having security around their pastors, that for me is like, where's Jesus? You're not letting the children come to you for questions? Like, how is that Christianity? Why is it that I'm able to give a water bottle or have a water bottle? Um, why is it that you can wear Supremes, but I'm having to like not know where my next meal was coming from? Well, I think I have many things to say about this. What I'm hearing is entitlement, right? You've got all this money coming in and the so-called pastor, the so-called direct line to God, as it were, is saying, well, why can't I be wealthy? Why can't I have the fancy clothing or shoe items? Why can't I have the expensive dinner? Why can't I have a nice lifestyle? To which the response would be that you shouldn't have anything other than the basics until your entire flock is covered. How hard is that to understand? To me, that basic human idea, if you're doing this in the name of faith, it's not like this is a corporation, right? That's why the CEO is in business, to make money. That's their singular motivation. So no one should act surprised when the CEO does a money grab. But when a pastor rolls up and derives their power from some presumed connection to God, and then they exploit that power to take everything for themselves and then create a rationalization around that, that to me feels narcissistic. Because it shows no empathy to these people who are coming in good faith, frankly, I think somewhat innocently. They're giving their money to support an institution that matters to them, that connects them to God. This person they've anointed as believing that speaks for God is that person has no empathy for those people, is deeply entitled, is very grandiose, is incredibly hypocritical, that that list is starting to add up into that uncomfortable space of this, this sort of narcissistic piece. Narcissism as a personality style is usually associated with arrogance, entitlement, variable empathy, admiration seeking, and has dynamics such as manipulation and invalidation and taking advantage of or using other people. However, it also has different ways of showing up. And a type of narcissism we often don't explore is something I call self-righteous narcissism and is a sort of rigid holy roller narcissism, a sort of self-serving morality, using this morality to shame, judge, and invalidate other people, and wearing two masks of seeming love and acceptance if someone plays by the rules, and quick dismissal and rejection if they do not. This self-righteous narcissistic style shows up in religious communities all the time, And since rule following matters so much in these spaces, folks and entire organizations with this style can psychologically harm people who may be trying to bring their true selves to their religion, but are told they aren't as worthy if they don't follow the arbitrary rules. It kind of really boils my blood because if if a CEO is narcissistic, I actually don't care. That's their job, is to make Mm -hmm. the shareholders profit. I cannot shop there. I certainly don't need to be the CEO's friend. But I don't feel like that's a a manipulation. I don't feel that that's cruel. That person's probably going to do a better job than someone who's sort of sweet and agreeable. It's that person's job. But when you're talking about a church, and I really like that you use that, that, that fable, that parable of Jesus and the disciples. It's interesting that in a way the disciples were in some ways kind of getting 
getting some juice from being close to Jesus, right? That was giving them some sort of Mm -hmm. power and entitlement. And Jesus, though, was pulling out saying, no, 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 that's not okay. So so Jesus played played it right. That's how it's supposed to be done. Unfortunately, these many people that are co-opting that which was considered to be healing and good have really actually basically, it sounds like nothing more, frankly, to me than a money grab. Yeah, for sure. Okay, so let me step back a minute here because I want to understand, because I want to understand, Noemi, what drew you to Hillsong? So I, when I moved to Boston, I had already left my family's church. I was coming for grad school here. Mm. Um, to study public health, so my master's in public health. I was very excited. I wanted something a little different. I I was also looking for a church that was welcoming of all people, regardless of uh, political background, regardless of uh, how they grew up. Like I wanted a place where everyone was welcome. And as I was searching for a church, um, I fell upon... Hillsong. And I remember as I was walking through the doors, I saw a sign that said, welcome home. And when I read that for me, it was, oh, wow. Okay. Well, a home for me is where everyone can come in as they are, Mm. uh, because a home is a safe space. A house is just a building, but a home is something you create. So I want to be a part of the creation of this home. So yeah, like, this is awesome. Like, welcome home. I walk a little more and then I see another sign that says, you belong. And I was like, oh, okay. So me as a, as a brown person, I, I belong here. Um, there wasn't too much diversity, but there was uh, a few black and brown people there. So I was like, okay, we can bring in more. Like I, I'm more than happy to help create this and diversify it. And it was very much geared towards younger people because they had like lights and their production was very high quality and you could help become or be a part of making it high quality. Um, and they had all of these cool tools and, and conversations and sermons were focused on younger people. So for me, it was really exciting. Um, and, and Hillsong being a church that was known for their music um, I had grown up hearing about Hillsong and the music that Hillsong would release within their different bands. Um, for me, it was really cool to now be a part of the church who was developing that music um, that I had heard about growing up. So it was a lot of that, a lot of finding a place where I could fit in in Boston, but also a place that I thought was racially diverse and that I thought was welcoming of everyone. And You also believe not only were they going to be accepting of you as a brown person, but as a queer person. Yes. At the time, I was still questioning. I was not openly questioning Mm -hmm. yet. I started doing that um, a year into me attending Boston. Um, But yeah, when I saw Welcome Home, You Belong, I thought it meant everyone. I didn't do research on a church because for me, like, that didn't have to be something I had to think about, like a church is a safe space, or that's how I grew up thinking. Like any church I attend or I'm looking for is a safe space. So why do I have to Google this church? So I didn't really do the research into that. I want to ask you a question though, okay? Because here's where I'm putting psychologist hat back on here. You said, I always thought of churches as safe spaces. But yet, when you were, when you approached the pastor in that church, you were met with, you're going to hell. They were cruel to you. They were manipulative to you. So where did that construct of church as safe come from? Because the church you had just left wasn't. So when I would see the church at the time, I wouldn't identify the church I was attending as something like it wasn't a part of it. Because for me, a church like that was very fundamentalist. So to find a church that was more quote unquote welcoming and liberal 
was a safer place than what I had grown up in. You wanted it to be okay. You're in a new city. You church, God, all matter to you. And the this the symbols in the space, welcome home, you belong. We use on this podcast that the sort of frame of what happens in these these kinds of manipulative relationships is we also find ourselves wanting it to be okay. So you were betrayed by one space. You were. I mean, I think it's fair to say that anyone who has been devoted and is coming into their own and and you're met with you're going to hell kind of thing, that's a betrayal. And in the it, with that betrayal having happened and now moving to a new city, you're going into this place. It's this one will be different. And that is a that to me is what happens to the vast majority of people. I mean, I think that that kind of hope is is something that many survivors of all kinds of manipulative situations have. What were those early days of Hillsong like for you after you walked in that door? Yeah, so uh, the early days were definitely. Uh, there was so much you had to do in this quality of production that you had to put on that it took a lot. Um, I was part of the host team at the time. And I remember I was one of the only uh, brown people on the team. And so they would put me at the front door Mm -hmm. and they would be like, we want you to be the first person they see when they walk through the doors. And I'm like, okay, like I see what you're doing. But internally, I was also like, great. Like I get to be a part of Um, how people see this church and what it could become. And if I am here as a representation that this is a safe space for Black and brown people, then yeah, I want to do that. So being a host was very tiring and I would start going home and sometimes be exhausted, fall asleep or just cry because I was like, I don't know why I'm so tired. Um, So I decided to switch over to another team called Events. And that's where I really started to see how the production was put on Um, from the run sheets that were done from the word to word, like paragraphs of what pastors and, and anybody who was on stage had to say uh, the level of uh, numbers that they had to count for people who were there, the note taking, Mm -hmm. all of this data that was sent to New York to keep track of what was happening. It was a group of like three or four of us having to do all of this work. And so it was, it was quite tiring, but it was also really cool, um, to see it from my, at the time, from that perspective, I had grown up in a church where, you know, if, there wasn't a drum player in that day and it was just a guitar. Great. We're just going to sing with the guitar at Hillsong. That was like non-acceptable. It was like, wait, why are we having to put on this production? Why does it have to be this high thing? Why can't it just be church? Um, it felt more like we were playing a game, the game of church rather than putting on church. Mm -hmm. They would definitely pin volunteers against each other to not Mm -hmm. focus on Mm -hmm. the, how the pastors were treating us Mm -hmm. because Mm -hmm. for events, we were being yelled at from the pastors for having gone over a few minutes or because he had told us he wanted church to be an hour and 13 minutes. And we spent an hour and 15 minutes. So we're being yelled at from them. So then we turn our direction to the creative team, which is the team who is on stage doing the singing and doing the stage management. We turn to them and start yelling at them and be like, it's your fault. You're the one who did this. You're the one who caused us to be yelled at and to get in trouble. They were like really pinning us against each other so that we wouldn't turn our face and see them and be like, wait, no, it's you that created the system and is causing us to do this. Um, so it's, they're really smart about it. And it's it's really it's really nasty when you look back and see how they did it. What they did there was the teams being turned against each other and that you were then starting to sort of call each other out and and sort of launch your wrath on the other teams is called triangulation. And it's how people in power remain in power. They create this chaos below so people are not facing over to where leadership is setting up 
an unsustainable system. And so everyone is sort of scrapping and scraping over these little things, but the way the system was structured is wrong. I, I, I guess a question for me then becomes, you're a volunteer, it's going, you feel like you're a part of something. It seems like they're saying we're inclusive, we're trying, we want to get more racially diverse membership, all of the things that matter to you. But when did things start to change for you? Yeah, so I started taking a gender and sexuality class in grad school. And I remember we were going around the class and we were all saying our sexual orientation and gender identity. And it got to me and I was like, uh, I don't know, I'm, I'm straight. And then they're like, okay, what's your gender identity? And I was like, I don't know what that means. And they're like, okay, I guess you're cisgender. And I was like, sure, yeah. And then once it passed on to the next person, I was like, wait, no, that didn't feel right. That didn't sit right. And so all of these things that I had hid for so long started to come up again. And I started to learn about gender and sexuality and public health and gender affirming care and what that looked like within public health. And so I started to uh, have a safe space where I can question within academia and then I would turn and look at my faith and be like, wait, is this a safe space for me to be in? And so then I started asking questions slowly, kind of approaching it. And so I would ask like, oh, I have, I have a gay friend and they want to come to church. Would they be able to attend this church? And they'd be like, yeah, everyone's welcome. Like they can come through the doors and come to our services. We would love to have them. And so I'd be like, oh, okay, great. And then I started to ask more and be like, wait, would they be allowed to volunteer? And they'd be like, oh, well, it kind of depends on what position they're in. And so then that's where it started more of like, wait, what do you mean it depends on what position? Uh, and they'd be like, yeah, well, if it's um, like a host, uh, maybe not. But if it's within like a background scene, yeah, that would be great. We would love to have them. I was asking all of these during a meeting I was having with one of my leaders. And I remember I ended the meeting saying, well, um, I'm the gay friend and I'm trying to have a better understanding if, if I am queer because I'm questioning and I'm starting to come into this place, would it be a safe space for me? Like, is what I'm doing okay? And the leader kind of stayed quiet and was like, okay, um, well, what you're doing is fine. Uh, like you're in, in events, so you're not really at the front, um, and you're leading a connect group with someone else, so I think it's okay, like, like, I don't have an issue with it, and so I was like, okay, but if I were to be under someone else's leadership, would I have to ask them, would I have to out myself to them again, like, is this gonna be a constant thing I'm gonna have to be doing, and she was like, yeah, well, it's a case-by-case -case basis, so yeah, and I was, I kind of stayed quiet and I was like, okay, this is going to be a bigger issue than I thought. And so I started asking myself more and more questions of, of was Hillsong going to be that for me? I also decided to come out to my mom at the beginning of 2019. And the day I did it, uh, my mom obviously didn't take it well uh, because she was a part of this other church that was openly very homophobic and believed that gay people and queer people were going to go to hell. And so that was what she said to me over the phone um, because that was the safest place I found for me to out and come out to her. Um, and so the next day I went to my leader's home and I told her like, hey, like I came out to my mom last night, so I'm a bit tired. I haven't really slept. Um, and so when I get there, I walk in. She's folding laundry and she sits down and I had told her over text, like, I don't really want to talk about this. I'm still processing. As I'm sitting down, she says, why did you feel the need to come out to your mom? And I kind of just stare at her and I'm like, well, like, it's a big part of my identity right now. And I want to like be able to have her acceptance or at least have her know. And I don't want to be hiding anymore. I've been hiding my whole life. And she goes on to say, well, 
isn't identity elusive? And I was like, oh, well, it can be, but like, no, like, this is who you are. And then she's like, well, shouldn't your identity be centered in God? Like, shouldn't you identify as a child of God first? And so then I look at her as a Black woman and I tell her, wait, do you not identify as a Black woman? Because when you're out on the street, people don't see you first as a child of God. They're going to see you as a Black woman. That's just the reality of where we live. And she kind of gets quiet and was like, well, no, like I identify as a child of God first. And I'm like, wow, like I, I wouldn't be able to do that. Like my ethnic identity is so big within me. It's a huge part of who I am. But that isn't bigger than this other thing that is my sexual orientation and my gender identity. So we kind of start having this debate back and forth. And I, I realized that she wasn't a safe person to go to. Um, so I stopped the conversation that day. But the conversations kept happening as new things started to arise uh, within the church. Um, so I started to have more questions. I started to be more vocal within social media. Uh, it got to the point one day where one of the pastors approached me and asked me to no longer post on social media um, because I was a leader in the church. And how could it be that I was posting that kind of a thing if that's not what the church believed in? And I looked at him and was like, I'm sorry, sir, but no, you cannot tell me what I can or cannot say. This is not a cult. <laughs> um, and if it is, then I'm going to leave right now. Um, and so I, I really set the boundary there. And I was like, so we were constantly in debates. It was starting to become like very much a back and forth with him and her of, of what it meant to be uh, to identify as queer and them constantly trying to convince me to identify as a child of God. But you went to that first pastor, your pastor, it sounds like in confidence. So how did other yes. people find out? Yeah, I told her in confidence from the start. Um, she ended up telling the rest of them. Um, so she outed me to them. And I only found out towards the end when I was in meetings with one of the pastors, um, he asked, I was going to be um, assisting him uh, with some like admin stuff and he wanted to meet with me. So I was like, sure. So we end up going to this coffee shop and whenever a pastor says that you're going to go to a coffee shop or meet up there, it's often never a good thing. So we end up going to his coffee shop and he's like, um, who is Noemi? Tell me about you. So I tell him, all about me. I don't mention the fact that I'm queer because I didn't feel the need to. Um, I just told him about my family, like my religious background, like anything that really pertained to what I was going to be doing. And like, I didn't want to talk about my queerness. And he kind of was not happy about that because he was expecting me to say more. So at the end of the meeting, he's like, uh, I want to mentor you. And so I was like, okay. So I look at him, this cisgender, heterosexual, white man. And I'm like, you want to mentor me, a brown person um, who's questioning their identity, their gender identity, and is clearly queer. Um, so I, internally, I was like, what the hell? But then externally, I was like, okay, whatever. Um, so I accepted it. The next meeting we come and he asked me, um, what is something that is holding you back from giving it your all at Hillsong? So I start thinking of whatever bullshit answer to say. And I end up saying, well, uh, Carl Lentz did talk about a bill that was passed in New York on abortion. And it's really frustrating because he's giving unfactual information to the congregation. So really that I'm, as a public health professional, I cannot stand by that. And I believe that regardless of your faith, people should given, be given every option available. He's like, is there anything else? And I kind of like stay quiet, um, look down a little bit. And then he's like, it's the fact that you're queer, right? And I look up and I'm like, wait, I never told you. Like, how did you find out? And he's like, oh, like I, I spoke to that leader that you told the first time. And I was like, oh, 
okay, I see what's going on here. So that part of me started to get, I was very frustrated that she had done that. And I started to connect the dots as to what had happened throughout my whole journey of me having this conversation with her. While I was having these conversations with her, I was having a mental health crisis. Being in grad school is hard. Uh, My family not accepting me. My mom literally condemning me again to hell. So I was reliving that past trauma. Having my church not know, like, if they were going to be welcoming of me and then coming to that realization once again that the place I had chosen and I thought was safe wasn't safe. I ended up having to admit myself into a psychiatric hospital uh, the first time while I was at Hillsong under the mentorship and support of this other leader who was being told what to do by this other pastor who wanted to mentor me. And so all the darts start connecting and I'm like, wow, okay, I see what was happening then and why she was telling me that instead of going to my therapist to read a devotional about waging war against your brain, that anxiety was a war you needed to win rather than something that could be maybe medicated if need be, if it's at that level, or that depression was just the devil bringing you down instead of saying, no, maybe there's something deeper happening Maybe talk therapy or medication could help. And I was very privileged to have had a pastor who was qualified, who knew what to do um, and in my life. She was my best friend's aunt. And when I was in the deepest part of my mental health crisis, uh, my best friend from grad school got me on the phone with her. Um, this pastor was a black lesbian pastor in a city close to Boston. And that phone call was very different from what Hillsong had, how they had approached my mental health crisis. She quickly heard me crying and in this space of how I had been viewing my mental health and having suicide ideation. And she quickly said, wow, it sounds like you're having a really hard time. Have you ever considered having a psychiatric evaluation? So she quickly understood her limitations as a religious leader and knew that it was important to then consult professionals in that field to give me the support that I needed. So I immediately saw the stark difference between her as someone who was qualified, who knew how to approach mental health crisis, and someone who was not qualified and was told to have me read devotionals and pray the depression away and wage war against my brain. So it was these two very stark realities of what was happening around me and seeing that this other pastor who was affirming of me and was helping me through this crisis went to go visit me in the hospital and give me spiritual guidance. The other people at Hillsong never showed up. And when I came out of the hospital that following Sunday, I realized very quickly that they wanted me to go back to being this volunteer producing at the same level I had done before, not realizing that maybe my brain needed a little bit of time to settle back into reality. Um, So all of these things were coming into realization. And I started to really look at it all and say, I don't think Hillsong is a good space, is a safe space. Mm -hmm. I don't think Hillsong is a home. Mm -hmm. No. No, and you know what unfortunate it is, is that it's a, it's such a tragic parallel process for you. You were once again sort of betrayed in a religious space. You know, so this place you've gone to, to be home, to belong, that uh, they, they, they betrayed your confidence by the, the one pastor who you likely felt a sense of trust with because she was a woman of color. I'm going to tell you as a woman of color that when we look to someone based on their minoritized status and then we feel betrayed in that space, it hits harder. Because there was a oh, presumption yeah. of trust there that does get sort of doubly violated. In essence, kind of what they were calling mentorship sounded like indoctrination. How can we turn you oh, yeah. into something different? And you, once again, were being invalidated for who you were. And you'd had the experience of coming out 
to your mother. She was not happy about it. That's an invalidation. You had grown up with invalidation. You were experiencing it again in this space. And there's even to me something, Noemi, invalidating about knowing that you're being chosen to be the greeter at the front of the church for a, a form of tokenism. That is a form oh, yeah. of invalidation because you're not being seen as a whole person. So all of this piling up, that, you know, through whatever divine mercy there was, there was someone in your life who did see this because this much betrayal and this much invalidation, you better believe it's going to end up in a mental health crisis, especially when you're not calling it as such, right? I really, as a psychologist, want to highlight the courage it, it required to check yourself into a psychiatric facility. Many, if not most people, even when they're in the throes of crisis, for any number of reasons, will not do that. The stigma, the shame, the not yeah. knowing, and you did that. So there's some, there's there's a there's a a steely spine within you that's giving you resilience at these significant moments. Because if those crises go unaddressed, Noemi the consequences can often be quite catastrophic. So, you know, yeah. I think that that's an important message to get out there too, is that when it starts feeling that bad is to go in there and get that help. So you did end up leaving. You decided, no, I don't want any part of this. You spoke out against Hillsong after you left. What happened? Once I left, I realized that they were being purposely ambiguous in all ways of their um, policies, but more specifically with LGBTQ youth and LGBTQ people, because they weren't being clear about who they were. The welcome home had terms and conditions. And so that for me brought in a lot of anger. And I started to post on social media. First, I reached out to the pastor, to the local pastor and was like, wow, like, I'm really angered at the fact that I served under you for two years and yet no one in your church could give me your church's policy on LGBTQ people and like where we could serve and what you believe in. I asked for it so many times and no one could give me a clear answer. Somewhat until the end, I had to pull it out of someone and for them to finally say, no, we won't marry a same-sex couple and no, we won't hire a openly queer person. Like I had to pull that out of someone. And so it was really angry me. And I messaged him that via Instagram, I DM'd him. And I was like, it's very like frustrating that I never had like anyone even care to like reach out after I left to ask why I left to even like do aftercare. Um, Cause I had seen so many people leave the church and for them to be like forgotten, nobody cared that they left. Like they continued as if nothing had happened. And so his response was very eye opening to me. He said, you, we loved you. And we asked people to give the same grace in return that they want to receive from the church. And I was like, wait, so it's transactional. He starts going on about like, yeah, you're uh, this leader. Like, I thought they were working with you throughout this process of you navigating um, your queerness. And I was like, wait, I never even told you. Now you're outing yourself that you knew and like, and you never cared as well. And so that for me was another eye-opening moment that I was like, okay, this was all interconnected. And I also felt really off about the way he spoke to me because it was sounding very gaslighting, manipulative. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um disregarding anything I had said and putting it with, we loved you and have grace for us. And for me, it was like, no, <laughs> like that's not how things work. So I screenshotted those messages and I ended up posting it on social media. Before I posted it, um, I said, like, this is not the way pastors should act. Uh, I'm going to share something very personal and it's very sad to see that some leaders think that this is okay to talk to the people who worked under them and to their parishioners um, or people part of their congregation that believe that they could use whatever language and gaslight and manipulate them. Within seconds of me posting it, and I tagged him in it, he replied to me very mad, um, 
saying like, why are you using your social media to, to call people out or to talk to people like this? Like, this is so disrespectful. Like I would never use social media in that way. And I look at him and say like, I tried to have a conversation with y'all. Y'all didn't listen. So I'm going to use any means necessary to get my voice out there. And he didn't like that. And then I quickly started to see all of these other leaders looking at my Instagram stories mm. and checking everything. And it didn't end there. Like they were checking every day for like almost three weeks, mm. going in, checking what I was posting, checking where I was at. Like, and so that for me started to get a little scary. And at the same time, I was receiving people responding like, yeah, get them. Oh my God, finally someone is saying something. But all of that was starting to get to me. And I started to get well, what we call on social media as trolls, people who create fake accounts to send you messages. So I was getting these troll messages that were very intense and were getting under my skin and were like really starting to hurt. And I started seeing myself fall back into this mentality that I had gone in the same pattern that had happened back when I went to the psychiatric hospital the first time. So because I was getting scared, because I noticed my mental health going down again, and I was exhausted of having to navigate this, I ended up admitting myself once again in 2020, just a year later, um, in order to ensure that it was a safe thing and I prevent anything from going and becoming worse. Your experience shows that a system that's this toxic, populated by toxic people, engaging with them you will always get sick. So, you know, oh, yeah. to, to post and, and have that kind of a battle, they're purpose built for this kind of thing. They can go to battle and not feel anything. It's what that, that conflict actually really, people who are very antagonistic and manipulative, they really thrive under that. But for somebody who's not built like that, especially in the era of the troll and all of that, is that you, advocacy work often means making noise, but if you're making noise and speaking out against a toxic system or toxic people in that system, they will come for you. And if you're not built for that, you will get sick. My question then becomes, faith has been a part of your life since the day you were born, and it has been some of the highest, brightest moments of your life, and clearly some of the bleakest. All together, how have these experiences affected your relationship with your faith are you part of are you part of a church now that's a good question and i laugh cuz there really isn't one now um yeah i i don't attend a church um i find church triggering mm -hmm. um meaning that if i walk in and i see a certain type of like word or service or any like smoke because they would put on smoke or certain lighting um it's a little triggering and i i feel very uncomfortable my body's like get out this isn't safe so yeah i don't i don't regularly attend a church i don't go i haven't gone um i attended church this past week because i am going to be studying theology oh. at bu congratulations um, and so i decided to go yeah thank you i decided to go to chapel um and it was a very affirming service and it was very liturgical. And I found peace in that, in the fact that I knew what was happening, but I didn't believe what they were saying, but I, I could respect where they were coming from because I understood. Um, but yeah, personally, I don't believe the ways I used to now more than anything. Um, I've gotten more intrigued and curious about my indigenous identity um, my grandparents on my dad's side were indigenous mm -hmm. and they converted to Christianity into fun that fundamentalist church and they left behind everything that they were. And so for me, for someone to have been colonized and assimilated the way they were, I want to do the work of going back and learning who I am and who our people were. Um, we didn't survive colonization from Spain for us to go back into it. So Correct. I want to decolonize mm -hmm. um, my faith and deconstruct it. And so I would view myself more as agnostic now. Um, wow. So if there is a God or if there is something wow. out there, I wouldn't view it as like this being or someone that uses he, him pronouns. 
um, because I feel like it's beyond pronouns or beyond beyond the binary. Um, and so it's something something humans really can't comprehend because we like to we can understand what we see. Um, and so that for me is more like I found I find div- divinity in in nature. I find divinity in other people. Um, if people are made in the image of God, then there is divinity within us. So I find divinity within others as well, um, in the good side of them. Well, you've really come a long way then in, in who you are in terms of your faith. And, and, and you go in there and you grapple with theology, which obviously is very different than fundamentalism or evangel- evangelical kinds of approaches, but really this this divinity that pervades everything, that's a huge departure. And after going through all of that, and you suffered, you really, really suffered, I do believe that coming back from a toxic relationship is a form of decolonization for everyone because it's really sort of a, a pushback on oppressive systems. But for you, it's much, much more pointed than that. So I guess I'll put this out to, out to you as a conjecture since you are studying theology. So let this be your exam question for the day. What is the healthy way to organize a religion? As someone who's experienced and studied a bit of religion um, and comparative religion, I don't know if there is a healthy way of doing organized religion Mm -hmm. because, oh, yeah, personally, I haven't had that experience. Mm -hmm. And I would hope, I would hope that church, and I'm going to use this as a very different perspective of church. Church is a group of people, is a community. Mm -hmm. So for me, a church is where the people in this community have their needs met because that is what Jesus was looking to create something that was liberating for all where they could have heaven on earth. And so if there is a form of organized religion that is seeking to do that, that is providing for everyone in the community, because back then they would all put into a, a pile of money and they would divide it up. It was a form of like socialism and communism and all of that, but they were all having their religion, their, their needs met. And, and that's who Jesus was like, that's what he was preaching. That was the form of liberation because they were living under an oppressive system, which right. was a Roman empire. Um, and that's the story that he's telling about their liberation and how to find liberation of the mind within a system that's so oppressive. Um, and also fight back against that system that was politically like oppressing them. Um, and so that for me, if there is a religious institution today that does that, that focuses on fulfilling people's needs completely and is doing a good job of advocating for them, then that is a healthy way to do it. Um, I haven't found it. Oh. I don't know if I want to attend it anyway. I mean, it's it's fantastic. And I guess if I were to say that there was a heaven on earth, I would say that for each individual person, that heaven on earth is that capacity to live fully into your authentic self, to face the world that way, and to have some spaces in your life where that true sense of you is seen and validated and loved and cherished simply for what it is, and that people have at least one person in their life that can do that and fully possessed of who they are. I think what is so sort of heartbreaking about your story is that you were basically told in this organization that brought you under a false pretense of belonging and home and and religion and God and love and all of that, that you were basically told that the minute you stepped out of line, you were invalid, you were not good. And to me, that's just pure destruction. And that it happened in an organization that had got so much traction all around the world and no accountability, no responsibility. Frankly, that makes me sick because that is that is the ultimate invalidation to do it from a place where people, again, come in with such vulnerability and to turn uh, whatever our faith-based relationships are with with earth, with nature, with God, whatever it is, and to literally 
devolve that into a transaction. I am so sorry you went through that. I really, really am. You know, this week they are releasing a new, a, another documentary series about Hillsong where we're going to hear more about what happened. Can I ask you how you feel about that? I'm going to say something that Brian Houston would always say. There is more. He always said that there is more. <laughs> and there's always going to be oh. more when it comes to things coming out. But I hope that the folks who were a part of it receive that the care and support that they need after it. Because it is not easy to do as someone who's done it before. Um, and I applaud them for doing so. So yeah, Amazing. there is more. There is more. Well, that there, right there. That that that's a lot to say. You you you've basically left the church. You've, what about in the rest of your family? Like you've made such a you've made such a a big, big arc of change. What about others that you've been close to? Yeah. Um. So twenty twenty quarantine was a blessing in disguise. Um. I had the privilege of quarantining with my family in Arizona. And they finally got to see me for me. Mm. They realized that nothing had changed, that they just knew a little bit more about me um, with this other side of me coming out. And they got to ask questions and really wrestle with what the church had done. Because by this point, I had already left and I was speaking out while I was there. And so they had a very eye-opening experience and decided to stop attending the church. Um, more specifically, my mom and my sisters. Uh, my brother still attends, uh, but my mom and my sisters wow. had had enough. They didn't agree with the fact that it was um, not inclusive of everyone, the ways that they had treated me. My mom, during one of the last conferences she went to, got on stage and said that, um, the church needed to love queer people more. Go, and mom. That, yeah, the church ostracized her, and she ended up leaving. And I was like, "Wow, yeah." Now you felt a little bit of what it was like. So, but kudos Amazing. to her. It took a big deal to do that. Um, and so now she's super um, happy for me and my relationship. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, is realizing that queer people can have healthy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, thriving same-sex relationships and so yeah she loves my girlfriend and she oh, loves my sister's love girlfriend that. who oh, also came out later i love this um yeah so it became really cool my brother's still navigating with understanding it all um having his daughters be also still within it um mm. and you know i wish him the best and i set boundaries for my own safety mm -hmm. um but yeah i my family is is great and they're doing great. Well, so what I really love about this story is that your family found its way back to their true selves. I mean, I think that that's, it's, it can sometimes be a real process to get to those unconditionally loving spaces. The real blessing is that you got there. And so, you know, to me, the real divinity in the story is that a mother got to reconnect with her child and see the beauty of her. So I really thank you for that. That's a stunner. Thank you so much, Noemi. So here's my last question. Okay. <laughs> if you were walking down the street again in Boston and saw those same signs on a church that said, welcome home and you belong, what would you do? Um, I would probably run to a store and grab a poster board and a marker. <laughs> and say terms and conditions apply. <laughs> that's it. Mic drop. We're done. Noemi, yeah. <laughs> thank you. And maybe that's what's so unfortunate is that when we're talking about love and religion, terms and conditions need not apply. So I can't thank you enough. This was, I've learned so much and and thank you and, and for teaching me in such a clear way. There's words I didn't, I've never understood. You really debunked those. So thank you. I'm so happy for you and your mom and your sisters, and, and I'm just so happy for all of that. So thank you for giving me that kind of heart uplift too. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Noemi. First, controlling and invalidating systems like some families or religious systems do not want people to bring their whole selves. Healthy systems do. 
any kind of invalidating relationship, whether with a person, family, or institution, requires you to check your identity and authenticity at the door. And this carries a psychological cost. It's not as simple as just giving in and then everything is fine. Noemi experienced several major mental health challenges and anyone who cannot show up as who they really are may experience despair, depression, anxiety, physical health issues, and a sense of existential discomfort. In our next takeaway, when we are looking for something new, we need to make sure we figure out what didn't work with the old. Noemi, as a young person, took the courageous step of stepping out of their childhood church and was searching for something better. And at that young age, was still coming into their own identity. And sadly, as they were working through all of that, fell into a system that once again would not support anyone's true self if it didn't work for the church's brand. When a person is young, this is still being figured out, which is why there is a greater vulnerability to repeating cycles, similar invalidation from a childhood religious community being repeated in Hillsong. As we get older and hopefully settle into our identities, we may get better at that discernment. But it does mean taking a minute to do what Noemi actually described as deconstructing. In their case, it was about faith. But this deconstruction process is about staying in touch with ourselves to protect ourselves from repeating cycles. In this next takeaway, a theme we observe in invalidating systems of any kind, whether it is a family or institution, is often a discouraging of seeking out mental health services. In Noemi's case, they were discouraged and it became about being better at faith. In other cases, families may tell people, it's all in your head or don't share your problems with strangers. The more toxic and dysfunctional a system is, the more it is concerned with its own preservation and less concerned with the health and well-being of the people within it. This is a dangerous setup because delaying mental health services can mean that a person's mental and physical health can deteriorate more precipitously. For this next takeaway, Noemi's story actually raised a form of gaslighting we don't talk enough about. When people are actually doing or saying something that is bad for you, in Noemi's case, having their confidential disclosure being shared with others in Hillsong or being told to actually view their identity in a different way that served the church, and then telling you that it is good for you, is a particularly insidious form of gaslighting. It's one thing to tell someone that there is something wrong with them, which is what we observe in classical gaslighting, but it's a whole different level when people are being told that a pattern that is harming them is good for them. It takes gaslighting and multiplies the toxic fallout. And in our last takeaway, ultimately, Noemi's story is a story of how faith in something outside of them transforms into faith within themselves. Many survivors of any kind of toxic circumstances, including religious abuse, will experience tremendous despair. But when they get the support, guidance, and validation to learn to trust themselves, be themselves, honor themselves, and practice self-compassion, these experiences can be a painful wake-up call that ultimately can bring people back to themselves. Noemi ultimately is studying religion, but not capitulating to the arbitrariness and self-serving quality of an organized group, finding their own authentic path forward. And in an unusual twist, which we don't always see, actually also lit a path forward for family members. Surviving can evolve into thriving. It just takes a minute.